Today, I want to talk about preamplifiers because after the loudspeakers and the power amplifier, it's probably the most important piece of equipment because it's the one that you're going to interface with. It's the one where everything connects to and the one that you all engage with. Now, three years ago, I made a video called What Amplifier? I explained the different types of amplifier from class A, A, B and D. And in that video, I kind of explain why I like power amplifiers so much. And that's because once you've got a good power amplifier loudspeaker combination, then you can build your whole system around that. And so for me, what I'm going to do today is I've chosen 10 preamplifiers, very different preamplifiers, very different pricing to explain my views on them and what I particularly like. And maybe it will help inspire you to see, have you made the right choice already? Or if you're in the middle of deciding, maybe this can help you. So I'm going to, as I say, talk about 10. There's, I may refer to a, a, an extra one or two along the way. Who knows? Um, these uh, talks are not scripted in any way. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to put them in order of price, retail price. We're going to start low and the last one will be the highest price in the collection. So let's get started. So the first amplifier, preamplifier I want to talk about is the Topping Pre-90. Now, this is an, a preamplifier that basically I'd never really heard about until my colleague in London, AJ, told me about it. And he said, Harley, you've got to check this out. Now, it's not this big. It's actually only this big. This is the, the Pre-90. Um, and it's a fabulous piece of kit. He said to me, oh, you've got to try it. You've got to try it. It's so good. It's so good. Um, and I have to say, when I looked at photographs of it on the internet, it didn't look that nice. But when you see it close up, actually, the build quality is superb. Um, OK, it's made in China. It's designed in China, I believe. But the quality of all the components on the back is, is really first class. Now, this preamplifier retails for about 600 euros. Um, and on it, of course, you've only got a, a you know, I think it's like two inputs here and we've got uh, two outputs, XLR and RCA. And for many people, especially if you're just streaming, you know, that's enough. But they do make an extender for an extra 250 euros. And here, then you have sort of like another three inputs here and another RCA input. And they have this kind of umbilical cord which they supply with it, obviously, which basically links the two together. Now, I've tried this and I've had this in my system for quite a long time. Um, apologies, Topping, because I told you I would be doing this. And uh, yeah, it's been much longer than I planned. Um, and as AJ says, it's really quite remarkable. Why is it remarkable? Well, first of all, what do we want in a preamplifier? In the ideal world, we want uh, the preamplifier to take our source signal and to amplify it in such a way to send it to our power amplifier to amplify. Now, that sounds very straightforward. Many people think that if you should be able to amplify a wire without adding coloration or distortion. Well, sadly, that's just not true. So every component that we put in that allows some amplification and obviously some kind of uh, impedance and resistance matching, so you get a good match between the preamplifier and your power amplifier, that will, of course, always add some degree of distortion or even coloration. But this little guy, it's incredible. It's like it's transparent. For a start, it's incredibly quiet. When you connect this up, I was thinking, oh, maybe it's not connected or maybe the loudspeakers aren't connected. You can turn the volume right the way round. And although it's adding a hell of a lot of gain, it's totally silent, really, really silent. Also, what I really liked about it was the fact that it didn't add any coloration at all that I could perceive. It was really clean. It wasn't cold. It wasn't 
analytical. It just was there. And when you turn the volume up with the little remote control that they supply you with, it's a nice little simple layout. Um, you, you know, it, everything responded nicely and you've got these programmable inputs. So basically, you can say, I want this input uh, with an RCA and I want it output as an RC XLR, for example. And if I've got a, a, my streaming device or a turntable or a CD player and one is typically much louder than another, I can balance that in the programming. So every time I switch from one to another, it's roughly the same volume. I can also program it so that when it switches on, it's always coming on at a safe volume. So you don't accidentally play way too loud and possibly damage your loudspeakers. Everything, everything about this preamp is basically perfect. It's also very small. I mean, to be honest with you, if I want to gripe, I don't really like the, the logo topping very much on the top. I think the, 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 the text on here slightly spoils it. But, um, but that's a tiny little detail. For this price, what it does is incredible. And when I say this price, I don't want to be patronizing towards topping because as you'll see later on in this video, this little guy is going to outperform some of the really big guns. It's got a, a massive di um, dynamic range. It can handle more than 130 decibels of dynamic range. And as I say, it's basically silent. So what don't I like about it? Well, the one thing I really, really don't like about it is the fact that this little remote control, nice though it is, you have to point it exactly at the front of this unit. And I found in, even at sort of, in my room, sort of two, three meters back, which is like 10 feet back, I've got to really angle it. So if I have it on the left-hand side of this stand, for example, I have to use my, my right hand. And if I was to have it here, I would kind of have to use uh, my left hand. I'd have to use my right hand. Um, and I've got to angle it. And I find that irritating. Now, I suppose for something that's so well designed and so brilliant, I was a bit surprised. But I suppose if um, I put a little receiver on here, an infrared receiver or an amplifier, and I know they exist, that you just stick them on the front, it would probably work perfectly. But that is the only, only downside I have. Now, the other thing is it's all switching relays, which you normally only find in really, really expensive pieces of kit. Um, so when you switch it, it goes up in half dB steps and jumps, which is really, really fabulous because I love those little sort of little touch and just bring it down half a dB or one dB. But you do hear the clicking, click, click, click. So when I'm making my great recording uh, videos, you'll often see me twiddling on the volume here to bring the music up and down as I'm talking. I, I couldn't use this for that because you would be hearing click, 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 click the whole time. Yeah, but having said that, this is absolutely a world-class top performer. Um, I, and I just, it's just so pure. It's so good. And it does its job so well that I've got, nothing else negative to say about it whatsoever. And for my colleague in, in London, uh, AJ, who, who's using this in the main demonstration system in our London studio, the, the remote control doesn't, doesn't bother him. I think, in fact, he's even got a different one which he uses, and that, that for him is nothing at all. So I'm just very, very picky and very fussy. So that's number one, the topping. A great, great investment. The second one I want to talk about is one that I've had in my listening room at home, uh, the Quad Atira. And I've had that for a very long time, probably since about 2014. Um, so, you know, getting on for 10, well, 10 years now. It's a lovely, lovely piece of kit. It's beautifully made. It just oozes quality. There's nothing flash or loud about it. It's got a lovely glass plate on the top and you can stack them on together. So it's just perfect. You've got a lovely functionality. Now, I've got the Play Plus, which is a CD player built into it. But we're talking about preamplifiers here, so we can ignore that. This is a pure, pure analog and you can choose what you want. You can have one with a a DAC as well, but if we're just looking at the pure analog one, 
um, we've got four inputs plus a moving my magnet or a moving coil. Now I haven't tried those with uh, my NIA turntable yet, um, but I can presume that it, it's it's sufficient, shall we say, because the rest of it is really good. You've got the fixed outs, XLR and the RCA, you can have them fixed or variable, so you can hook it up to subwoofers or whatever you want to do. There is a built-in headphone amp, and it's very nice because the headphone socket's just tucked away neatly in the black line that goes underneath the fascia, so you don't even see it. Typical quad styling, really classy. And you get the feeling that this is built to last. I've got quad equipment, as you all know, from even 1977 and some from the 80s, and they're still working perfectly well today. And when I tell you that this piece of kit is 1,400 euros, I mean, you just can't go wrong. The uh, remote control works really, really well. It's intuitive. You can switch everything off. You can put it on standby. You can you know, do everything that you want to do. Just like the topping, actually, you can pop that onto standby. You can boot it all up. And as you'll see, this isn't necessarily the case. So the Quadratera is definitely one that you should look at and don't be put off about the price. This is a passive, this is a, sorry, uh, an analog preamp and it does its job beautifully. Now, the next one. Now, this is uh, really a big departure. This is a, um, a passive preamplifier by the company called Hattor. Now, I was really, really, really hoping that I could work with passive preamplifiers. Now passive means that there's actually no amplification in it at all. It's just basically an attenuator. So if you've got a CD player with an output, should we say it advertises it as two volts, what it actually means is with the loudest music you can get on a CD, imagine it's mastered to what we call zero, the absolute top limit, then you would get two volts output. I'm simplifying a little bit but Bear with me. So that means you've got it extremely loud. And if you plug that straight into a power amplifier, depending on how much gain the amplifier has, how much power it has, it would be extremely loud. So all the, the Hattor has to do is turn it down. And normally it's OK because a lot of modern music has a very low bandwidth. Um, and you've got if you've got enough output on your from your CD player or your streamer, then it's great. But what if, and it does often happen, the streaming server has got a, a recording with a very low mastered output. What if you've got a very, very quiet passage in the middle of a, a, a symphonic movement and there's just a little faint violins or the double basses in the background? And what if you want to turn it up and up and up and really listen in detail? Or like in the old days when... There's a little bit of talking on a record or something somewhere. I'd really want to turn it right up and quickly turn it down before the music came in to hear exactly what they're saying. Well, with a passive preamplifier, you can exclude all that. Now, I know there are lots of people with passive preamplifiers who have got them in systems which everything's really balanced and it really suits them. But be careful. Because, for example, if you were going to go with the Tori 5 amplifier, and it's actually an integrated in the sense that it has two volume controls, for one for each channel. If you want to drive it at half volume, but boost the input so it can really get a little bit more second order harmonics from it, which can happen, with a Hatter you can't. But... Hato have already foreseen this and they do sell a tube active unit, but the tube active unit is 1,900 1, euros. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's quite a lot of money because the passive, the big passive with lots of connectivity is also somewhere between 900 and 1,900 euros, depending on what uh, quality of resistors and, and, and internal components. You can really configure it and I do recommend you reach out to Hattor and explain your system and what you're looking for because they will give you really really good advice and make sure you don't make a mistake because I'm sure like any manufacturer they don't want customers to end up with a piece of equipment that's not right for them.
So that's the Hatter. Uh, I mean, it's a fascinating thing. And uh, again, handmade and you know, really nicely made. Got a lovely remote control. I tried it out in our listening room in London, and yeah, it was very interesting. But I quickly thought, you know what? It's too cold. There's something something about it that didn't engage me and it was probably just the, the, the you know the synergy between that and and the couple of power amplifiers that we linked it to but very quickly I realized that without that active tube unit it definitely would not be for me um, I haven't tried it with a tube unit if if and when I do I will make an update in the notes of this video now the next preamplifier I want to choose is not really a preamplifier. So it's actually an integrated amplifier with some a DAC and with streaming and with everything else. So why have I put it in here? Well, I've mentioned it before, so I'm not going to go into detail here. It's the Lingdorf 1120. Now, it does have a couple of uh, RCA inputs. One is dedicated to moving magnet sadly, because I'd like it to be variable uh, so you could actually choose what you wanted it to be. But it's an extremely versatile piece of equipment. You've got one uh, RCA output, if I remember correctly, um, and I use it in my home cinema system where I listen to two channel, but I also watch te television and, and movies. And the reason why I like it so, so much is it's, it's incredibly you're able to program it to however you like. So I've got it all set up with a control four system, which means just one remote control. And I go watch TV and this little preamplifier will switch over to action movie setting in the filters. Um, it will switch on. It will, it will actually control the switching on of the relays, which power up my, my power amplifiers and all of these things. Um, it has lots and lots of possible inputs from the from the digital inputs and instead of having to go one two three four five six seven eight nine different inputs or and clicking all the way through you can just in the software say oh i want that input and that input and that input and then you can hide all the rest so you only see on the dial what you actually need now i have to say the photography from lingdorf is pretty poor to be honest so that dial looks a right mess with all those white dots in reality it looks way better in real life than it does in the photos and it works so so well quite a few of our clients have got them uh, you, also it has something called room perfect which can in some instances help but you can also create your own equalizations and stuff like that. A little warning for Sibelius owners, if you're going to go with an 1120 and you want to set up Room Perfect, contact us because we've got a special document telling you how to do it because you've got to be careful. But it's really a fantastic preamp. I wish it was a preamp. The reason why I, it's not a real preamplifier is you don't have a lot of inputs and you don't have a lot of outputs. But... It is also a very, very good, clean amplifier. It's uh, about 60 watts per channel, if I remember correctly, and you've got lots of controls and settings, so you can hold it back or you can boost it. Um, you need to check it out. If two inputs or, or one input is enough, then that's great because you've then got, for example, your streaming and you've got your built-in DAC and everything in it. So. There is another video on it. We'll put a link to that video on the Lingdorf 1120, but I included it because also, I forgot to mention, it's 2,000 euros. It it's, hasn't got a headphone amplifier on it, but it's expensive, but not incredibly expensive and very useful and very versatile. And if for whatever reason you decide to replace it from your main stereo system, two channel system, it's a lovely little desktop uh, streaming amplifier box as well. All right, so the next one, now I'm really excited about this one. This one comes from my pro audio background. Um, it's made by SPL and it's called the Elector. It's a fabulous piece of kit. If there's one item of hi-fi equipment, apart from my loudspeakers, that I want to keep, 
if for some weird reason the bailiffs were coming and taking all my stuff away or I had to go into a nursing home or something, what is the one piece of kit I would want to keep? Well, that would be my uh, Fonitor 2 from SPL, which is essentially the same box, but it has a headphone uh, amplifier and whatever, and I use it on my desktop. But the electronics inside are fundamentally the same. They're 120 volt rail system, this one is really designed as a pre-amplifier. You've got your three RCAs and three XLR inputs. You've got nice uh, outputs. It's got this massive 130 dB dynamic range, 32 decibels of gain, which is massive. So you can just keep turning it up and up and up and up and up and up and you will have and supply enough for any power amplifier. It will just go with absolutely anything. It's compact, it's, it's, I don't know, it's about 28 centimeters wide, about this wide. Um, it's beautifully made. And why do I love it so much? It's just the look and the feel and the coziness of it. It's got the little VU meters, which on my desktop is quite, actually it's useful for me when I'm actually checking and monitoring and um, on playbacks and stuff, I can see where we are. But also when you put it on mute, for example, they go red. So you think, ah, I'm on mute. How often have I put something on mute and then later on come back in and think, oh, why is there nothing playing? Why is there nothing playing? Turning up the volume and then letting the mute off and then bang. So none of that with this. This is designed from a pro audio background. People, it, SPL were really making equipment for um, recording studios. And what they're doing is they're using, reusing this technology, this 120 volt rail system that they're using, Volt Air, I think they call it, um, in lots of pieces of equipment from DAX and Phono preamplifiers. So you can also get lots of other accessories to stack on top and it looks fabulous, but it works well because it's silent. It's really, really quiet. The Lingdorf is quiet too, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with it, but there is, with this unit, <laughs> I'm gonna get, yeah, I know people are gonna write comments about this, but it's a piece of equipment I can get emotionally attached to. Goodness knows why, I don't know, but it just works so well. And the feel of that Alps volume control. And that's another neat thing, you know, I hate lots of um, remote controls. With this one, you can just press a button on the back, point whatever remote control you want at it, and um, it will basically learn it. Now, it will only do the volume, but even little things like you push the volume up, it'll jump maximum 3 dB. When it to come down, it'll just keep coming down at the pace you, you push that button. So you want to check that out. This is something that you can put in the highest end system and it's 2,700. Now I know for a lot of people, 2,700 euros is a lot of money, but for what this is, this is a lifetime investment. I think it's absolutely fabulous. Now, my next one, the Musical Fidelity M8S Pre. This is a piece of kit that I know extremely well. When you buy a piece of equipment, it's often a wow, wow, wow when you first get it. And after a while you begin to discover its weaknesses or its quirkiness or its characteristics, should we call it. And so the one thing about this piece of equipment is I never tired of using it. I never tired of using it. I always loved the look of it. It's, it's a really attractive piece of equipment. It's just in one of the other studios at the moment. So I haven't got it in here, but we'll show pictures of it. It just looks lovely. It's not white front. It's a sort of slightly off white and the little blue uh, lights and, and it's just gorgeous. The thing about it, when I first bought it, shows you my, my thinking here. It was four and a half thousand euros. You can buy it for about four thousand these days on discounts and whatever, but basically it's four and a half thousand euros, which when I bought it a few years ago, I thought, well, that's a lot of money for a preamplifier. There's no DAC in it. And you get this remote control. And I just thought, musical fidelity? You've got to be kidding me. This is just a piece of lightweight plastic and it just, just looked rubbish. But it works really well. 
So, you know, I can switch from all the inputs. The volume control is nice, it's intuitive. It doesn't jump too fast or too hard. You can go up in half dB steps. Uh, obviously you can put it on mute. It's, it's a lovely piece of kit and it's obviously designed to work with other musical fidelity pieces of equipment. It works really, really well and it's not critical about how you point it, but you can't switch it off. You cannot put it on standby from here. If, if you know how to, please put it in the comments, but I've never found out how to do it. And you can't boot it up, so you have to touch the button. Now, you might say, that's, that's stupid. What's, what's wrong with getting out of your, your, your chair and touching the button? Well, two things. If your hands are a little bit dirty, you've been eating some crisps or something and you've got a bit of grease on them, you don't really want to touch the front of the, of the cabinet. Um, so sometimes a remote control is useful. If you're disabled, a remote control is really useful. If you're ill in bed or whatever and, and, and you want to use your system or, or whatever, you don't always want to. If you're going to design a remote control and it's going to look cheap and nasty like this, at least let us switch the thing off and switch it back on again. So I've had my gripe, but for the rest of it, it's absolutely fantastic. The output is really high, so you can run long, 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 long uh, cables from that to your power amplifier, as indeed you can with the SPL, as indeed you can from the topping. Um, it's got, you know, lots and lots of inputs. Let me just think, it's, uh, it's fully balanced Class A circuitry, but we'd expect Class A circuitry in, 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 mo in preamps, to be honest with you. The output's very low impedance. Um, it, it pairs really, really well with the M8S power amplifier. There it's... It's just a match made in heaven. Um, really, it's an AB amplifier, very powerful, lots of dynamics, but it's not hard, it's not harsh. It's close to being, a, it's sounding like a, a, um, a Sugden Class A, but it isn't, but it's just got a bit more grunt. So ideal for speakers with a little bit harder on, on the upper mids. I'm thinking of speakers like, for example, the 800 series from Bowers and Wilkins um, and maybe some Kef loudspeakers, um, also Focals. This is the kind of amplifier and pre-amplifier combination which would drive something like that really, really well. The downside for me was after a while I was playing with others, especially the topping, and I did notice that it's got a little bit of coloration. It's a sort of warm, cuddly, nice sound. And to be honest, some, I like things a little bit more clinical and a little bit more detailed. Um, but it's really, really good. And uh, as I say, it's got a moving magnet and moving coil inputs. It, they, they're OK. They're not fantastic, to be honest, but they work very well, especially the moving magnet one. And for 4,000 euros, or four and a half thousand, it's actually very good value for money. Um, the After a few months when I had it on here, I did notice a little bit of transformer hum coming in. So I had to do the um, AJ's famous um, squash ball technique. You get, you buy a couple of squash balls, you cut them carefully in half with a sharp knife, then you put them as a dome, plunk the thing on top, and underneath each of the four feet, and it just takes away any hum, any mechanical hum going through the surface of your top. There's a little tip there from AJ in London. Now, it's a very good system. I can highly, highly recommend it. And even though I've been nasty about this remote control, it did work really, really well. And without it, some of the things I'm doing in this listening room would not be possible. I did a video comparing lots of different um, CD players and with that machine it was perfect I could just switch over and no one could really see which one was which now four and a half thousand euros gets you the musical fidelity go up another thousand euros and you will have a massive leap now I don't mean a massive leap sound wise or quality wise to listen to but a massive leap in finish and just, well, look at this thing. It's the Michi P5 S2. This is the high end. If you don't know Michi, it's basically Rotel in a beautiful case 
and with uh, advanced electronics. It's the real high-end part of, of, of Rotel. Now, I've never had it in this listening room. I've heard it in major uh, shows, and I know that's not the same. But just looking at it, for a start, you know, when you, you see it, it weighs 23 kilos. That's a bag of cement. I can, you know, it's the same weight as our massive uh, oak loudspeakers here. Um, th that's, for me, that's about the max I can lift. It's 48 and a half centimeters wide. It's a big, big thing. It will just fit in here. It's a monster of a thing, in fact. But it's beautifully made and the display is lovely. Um, it's built in China in Rotel's own factory. So it's own plant there. So we can be sure that it's, pop it's a very high quality. It includes a DAC with lots of inputs. It's got moving magnets, it's got moving coil, it's got MQA, it's got USB, you name it. This thing has got it. And it's got a lovely, lovely remote control as well. And so this, if you're into big stuff, this is really, and you can afford five and a half thousand euros, this is gonna be great value for money, but you've got everything in one. So that when new technologies come in and whatever in the future, maybe a lot of what you have is uh, redundant. And, you know, I'm kind of keen on keeping the preamplifier as clean as possible. Um, or if it's got DACs and things like that, having modules that you could sort of plug in or plug out. But that's a small comment. Value for money. This thing looks great. From what I can hear, it sounds really good too. Now, I did hear in detail the Rotel version, which I'm told has got, no, I can't say inferior electronics, not as quite as high end as the Michi. Um, I did hear that in detail in London and it sounded great. So I don't really have any qualms about this not being a very sensible choice and it's well worth checking out. All right, now, next one. Haha, <laughs> here we go. Back to Sugden. I know I talk a lot about Sugden. This is the little guy here tucked around the corner behind me. It's the DAP 800. I used to have an LA4 from Sugden and I thought that was fine. It was a little preamplifier and had various XLR and RCA inputs. And my distributor suggested that I try this one out. And I reluctantly tried it because, again, it's not cheap. This is 5,700 euros retail price. Um, OK, it's got a built-in DAC, which normally costs 2,700 euros. So, you know, you can say, OK, probably nearly half of this is down to the DAC. But it's a completely different architecture. And I did notice that the LA4 was a bit noisy. I do tend to turn things right up at times, especially in quiet passengers. And I did notice that this was a little bit, the LA4 could be a little bit on the noisy side. Um, this one is not. It's not as quiet as the SPL or the topping, but it's neutral. When I went from the musical fidelity to the Sugden, suddenly, I could hear things. The sound stage was a little bit more open, a little bit more detailed. It wasn't harsh or bright. It was a lovely sound. For me, there was a, a difference between the two, which justified the 5,700 difference. Um, it's got six analog inputs and six digital inputs. And what is really good are the outputs. Now, when I've got it here, I've got it connected to lots of different amplifiers, lots of different source uh, inputs. And the great thing is you've got two variable RCA outputs and one fixed. Now, why do I want a fix? Because I want one to go to a power amplifier or I want one to go to an, another power amplifier below. Those are the fixed. Uh, sorry, sorry. I want the fixed ones to go to my integrated amplifiers, of course. And I want the variable going to my power amplifiers. Um, what am I saying? So that's really useful. But what I've noticed is with many, many preamplifiers, when you connect more than one output, like the tape out, which is typically fixed, and one or two variable, 
you'll notice a difference in the sound. So you, you play it, you just play it through, you know, one of the outputs, then pull the RCA cables out from the other outputs, which are not yet playing, and you'll notice it will get louder because the resistance has changed and the load on the, on the preamplifier is changing. And that is normal, but with the sudden it didn't happen. And this meant I could connect so many pieces of equipment. And they did, do actually say on their website that this is an ideal for connecting systems. And it, and it darn well is. It's a really, really good system. But I have some dislikes about it. For a start, it's typical Sugden build quality on the outside. For 5,700, compare it to the Michi, well, you can't. It's not even anywhere close to the Michi in terms of build quality in terms of the casing and everything. The remote control, I've said it once, I'll say it again, is just ridiculous. The only thing you can do with the remote control with the preamplifier is the volume up and volume down. And it is good, you know, if I touch that once, it will just got one little notch, maybe half a dB, and it's totally under control. It will never run away with you, that's great. But you can't put it on standby, you can't boot it up, you can't switch a channel, you can't switch an input, you, you, nothing, just the volume. And I would have thought that it would be good for Sugden to invest in some relays and some switching. I know it would increase the cost, but for some people that will be a deal breaker. I'm just going to mention it, the DAC that's in it, because you can't buy that architecture of preamplifier from Sugden without the DAC is fantastic. It's an old TDA Philips uh, chip. I think it's the 1543, I'm not sure, but they had the, the famous 1541, one of the early ones. It's basically only 16-bit. You can play 24-bit, and I think you can even go up to 192 24-bit, but it will actually only play back in 16 which, to be honest with you, is not a problem at all. And when I compare the DAC in there with some other expensive DACs and more high-performing DACs, to be honest with you, I much prefer this. And I've done quite a few now. Uh, I don't really want to name names, but there's something about this Sugden DAC that sounds so lovely, so engaging. There's detail there, but it's warm. It's much closer to what some people would say an analog sound than, than, you, than you might imagine. It's really, really enjoyable. You can listen to it for hours. So for me, with the DAC and everything built in, with its separate power supply and inside, it's basically two units in, in one big outer shell. This is a really, really fine piece of kit. I have no intention of replacing or changing that. Also, it's got um, a volume control, and out, um, which is nice and easy to use. There's no clicking. There's, it's, it's predictable. And I must say that the, I don't know if I mentioned it already, the SPL has a fabulous Alps volume control, really beautiful to the touch and very intuitive. And for me, that's what I really like. So that's the Sugden. OK, we're getting through them. Now we're going to go to the PS Audio, the BHK Pre. Um, this is quite a fancy piece of equipment. It's l beautifully made. I love the way that you switch it on by just touching the little logo on the top left hand side. BHK stands for Bascom H. King, the, the person I, who designed this. It's got five uh, identically balanced and single ended inputs. Um, what can I say? It uses two 12 AU7 tubes um, and I want to warn you here too many people think that if you've got tubes in an amplifier or a preamplifier and that I mean vacuum tubes or valves as they say in England that it's going to sound warm that is not necessarily the case you mustn't link warmth as in heat coming out and in something glowing and looking sexy with warm mid-range. Not at all. I mean, I've known preamps with tubes in them that sound quite harsh and bright and, and over-detailed, to be honest. So please don't make that assumption. Um, people will put a tube into a preamplifier for a very specific reason. They want a very specific effect. Now, I've used this preamp 
uh, here in the listening room here, but we also used it in the Bristol Hi-Fi show recently when we were launching our brand new power amplifier, which I'll talk about in another video. I've just got it for a few weeks here for the just arrived. So I want to get to really know it at first because I didn't design it. It's designed by other team members in Pearl Acoustics and you working with some external people, but we'll come back to that in another video. So I've been using that for a three day solid in Bristol and I did find the um, PS Audio very, very good. Um, however, when I had it in the listening room and when we tried it in London in the setup in London as well, when you compared it with the topping, sorry about this, the topping was just cleaner, was just a bit more detailed. It was just a bit more dynamic. It was a bit more lively, a bit more real. So for me, the topping outperformed this machine. So why would I have the PS Audio BHK in my listening room rather than the topping? Why would I pay 7,000 euros for it? Because that's what it costs compared to 600 euros. Because of the remote. The remote control is really intuitive. You can point it from any angle and more or less, and it will react. Whereas the topping, it won't, and it's very annoying. And if I'm giving a demonstration in here in the listening room, and certainly in hi-fi shows, sometimes you're at a very uh, um, acute angle, to, uh, obtuse angle to, to the piece of kit. And you, you know, you don't have always a lot of choice and you want it to respond. With a topping, it would be hopeless. You'd have to sit right in line with it. But, so that, from that point of view, it was good. It was lots of detail, lots of harmonics. You know, it was a lovely, lovely preamplifier. I'm just saying that purely on audio point, I think the topping had the edge. But there's another thing I, I'm not really liking about the PS Audio Pre, and that's the switching. Because they've got a lot of, um, you know, their little clicking, I've forgotten what they call the servos in, in them, uh, which they then relays that click in and out as you turn the volume, goes click, 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 up and down. Again, just like the topping does. Now, I know you do it for design reason, for purity reasons for just it's the right thing to do technically but it's irritating especially <clears throat> excuse me when you can hear that clicking effect through your loudspeakers and i have to say the ps audio sometimes when you turn it up or turn it down it goes dunk, 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 it will sound will drop out and drop back in maybe only for half a second or something or even a second, but it's annoying, it's irritating when you just want to tweak it up half a dB or a dB or bring it down and then suddenly, you know, you've got this click, click or click and then you're dropping it down five dB, click, 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 click and then suddenly it will drop out, the sound will drop out and drop back in again. A number of people commented on that in the, in the, in the listening room and people say, yeah, Harley, you should leave the, the remote control alone. Well, sorry, I am someone who likes to dance the remote control a bit. I like to take the volume up and there's generally just reduce it down slightly sometimes. And I'm, especially if I'm demonstrating the system saying, look, it can play really, really well, nice and quiet. I want to turn it down. There's no seamless going down. It's tuk, 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 tuk. and I, you know, I didn't really like it. So from that point of view, um, it wasn't the best. The output wasn't that high. So it was technically, in my opinion, outperformed by pieces of equipment which were much cheaper. But it's beautifully made. It's handmade in America. The SPL is handmade in Germany. Um, but yeah, it's, it, the, the PS Audio is a much more sophisticated piece of kit, more circuitry inside. So I'm not saying it's not worth the money. It's horses for courses. You need to choose whether that's the right one for you yes or no, and probably will be brilliant in a PS Audio system. Obviously, it's designed for that. Okay, now, alongside the PS Audio, and I haven't heard this one for so long, so I'm not going to talk much about it, is the Pass Labs XP12. This is 8,000 euros, so we're getting into serious money here, and it's just got basically two XLR and three RCA inputs. Um, it's a very solid construction. 
It's got a step volume, 100 dB, uh, 1 dB volume step system, switchable inputs. It's very clean, low noise, if I remember correctly, but it's a long time. It's an absolute classic. So if you're going PS Audio, you might want to look at the Pass Labs because of the reputation that they've got as well to, to decide which of those two would suit you best. But it's a classic and I couldn't overlook that one um, at all. Now, um, now for my last preamplifier, it's the Mola Mola, the one here. Now, some of you know that I know Bruno Putzis. I don't know him that well. We've met a few times um, and I wanted to try this one out for a long time. Um, it is very expensive. It's 9,000 euros just for the preamplifier, which is a lot of money. I get it. Um, it has an app, a bit like the Lingdorf, where you can configure the inputs, which is quite handy. You don't have to climb around the back and switch all the wires around. You can just do that on the app. Um, you, it will learn, you know, your, your controls. I, I was using the remote. I forgot to pick up from Bruno. He's, he's a remote control. He's on holiday, so I borrowed this thing. But uh, so I just used the Arriga remote control and it worked really, really well. You see, you can hear it now. And if you hear it, listen closely, listen. This has got relays too, but it's got lots of them. And, they, and it's a bit like, um, well, it's not like rain, but it's a little fine, fine little click. So when you're sitting down in your chair, you don't really hear it. And if you do, it's just subtly in the background. But the big plus of this over the PS Audio is those clicks are not audible through the loudspeakers. You just get a nice, beautiful, smooth, up and down. And for me, that would be worth the extra thousand euros by a long shot. The other thing is the remote control works no matter which way you po point it. It's not RF, but you see I'm on the ground, on the top, I can point it to me and it's still working. Quite how it does it, I really don't know. I think there's some trickery underneath here that is working really, really well. Even close up, we tried it the other day through our hand and it was still working, but it's not RF. So isn't that amazing? Um, so what do I like about it apart from the volume control? I like the fact you can switch all the inputs, even from a different remote control from your chair. I like the fact it's absolutely silent. I like the fact that there's no distortion. I mean, on a pure side-by-side -side level, the topping at 600 euros and this one at 9,000, from an audible point of view, will be performing almost identically. Why? Because they've both pushed the boundaries to the limit. The difference here is this lovely user interface. The volume control is lovely. The remote control works from every angle. It's beautifully made. It's a sculptured work of art. It's a statement piece, but it also works extraordinarily well. So the other thing that's really good is that you can buy a phono module. And I think it's about, uh, I made a note here, yeah, 2,190 euros. And I've tried that. It's really, really good. It, 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 even on moving coil, low volume, it works really well. I'm not saying it's the best in the world, but it works sufficiently well. It's good. But what is amazing, but incredibly expensive, I don't know why it's so expensive, is the DAC. You use a DAC module, which literally costs 7,000 euros, just the module. Um, but when you buy it all together, you can get it in bundles and you can pick them up secondhand for about 11,000 and they're about 16, 17,000 with everything included, which is a hell of a lot of money. But if it's a lifetime investment and money is not a problem for you, the DAC is incredible. I thought the Sugden DAC was really, really good. I've compared it, you know, with others, many others, as I say. And you think, OK, I'm listening to the South and I think, oh, wow, this is the best yet. And everything's so musical. It's just like the, the musicians are there. You've got all the harmonics, the nuances, everything is there. And then you put, you put, switch over to the Mola Mola Makua DAC. 
I think it's the same as the one that goes into Timbaki. It's incredible. It's just like another level. So if you're one of those people who has no problem with spending 17,000 euros and you want the very best in the world, I think that DCS Bartok or this, I think this really, it's staggering. Am I going to buy one? No. I'd love to keep it, but it's a lot of money. It's a really a lot of money. And unless I find one secondhand somewhere, um, it's just out of what I'm prepared to pay for that difference. It's a shame because it's really, really nice. And that remote control and all the switching and the functionality, it's absolutely fabulous, to be honest. So to summarise then, where are we? We've gone a long way. Thank you if you're still with me. For me, a preamplifier has got to be quiet. It's got to give me lots of gain without any distortion and without any noise, well, virtually no noise, virtually no distortion on the Mola Mola, it's unmeasurable. I think if you go to the, uh, even the topping, it's basically unmeasurable or very close to that. But it's got to be for me about functionality. It's a long-term relationship. It's the kind of piece of kit that you would never want to replace. So I want that volume control to work. I'd love to be able to switch inputs if I could. I'll put up with it with the Sugden because at 5,700, it's a lot less than this and I can just get out of my chair and change it. Um, but why should I? So if there is all of these compromises. Um, the sound will make a big difference. It's got to sound right. But when you've got the, the, your power amplifier and your speaker combination right, and you've got nice quality source components, then if you can get hold of a couple of pre-amplifiers and try them out at home, this is the one piece of kit that you really want to try at home if you possibly can, um, and, and, and try it with the, the remote controls, as I say, of those things. And decide for yourself whether it's right, because, I find it a shame when people are constantly buying and selling and losing a lot of money in the re second-hand prices. It's much better to try and get it right if you possibly can. So that's my summary. So um, the great news is that you can have fantastic sound. You can have the, the sound quality that millionaires have in their multi-million euro systems from a pre-amplifier that costs 600 euros if you're prepared to forego some of those luxuries. But if you have the budgets and you want to go that extra mile, there are some beautiful, beautiful pieces of equipment on it. This is, this is a Bugatti of pre-amplifiers. And there's no way around it. These things cost money and there's nothing you or I can do about it, sadly, and most of us will never, ever own one. But it doesn't really matter because it's the music that matters. And when I was 12 years old, around at my friend's house, we used to play records on a dance set and we were happy and we used to laugh and we used to listen to the Rolling Stones or whatever. And even though I used to listen to classical music on very simple systems, because once you're connecting with the music and you're enjoying the music, at the end of the day, that's all that matters. If you have been, thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next video where I'll be talking about Nina Simone's album.